only. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, Arlington Up only. Hello and welcome to Up Only TV. I'm Ledger. We got Kobe and the king of all sat stackers, Michael Saylor, on the show today. We're excited for everybody to be here. First, let me tell you about our partners at FTX. Go to uponly.tv slash FTX. Make a trade there today. You can go directly from one asset to the other super easily on the FTX app. Uponly.tv slash FTX trade with zero fees stack sats on a recurring basis if that's your desire or even buy shit coins we'll ask sailor about that uh thanks for being here thanks ftx let's get to the episode kobe how you doing i am nervous mate it's giga chad himself it's actual sailors <laughs> here <laughs> like we're called up only but he is the true up only poster boy sailor how you doing awesome thanks for having me you know, you're the most popular podcaster that's invited me on. My notifications went nuts when you started <laughs> posting. And I, I thought, you know, I said, okay, yeah, maybe we'll do this podcast. And all of a sudden I see like 25 blue checks like the thing. And I thought, who is this Kobe dude? He must be the OG podcaster because I've never seen anybody so popular in my notifications. Yeah, we, we only started doing it a year ago. And honestly, we don't really talk much about markets or crypto or Bitcoin. We just get drunk. And sit here and let, that explains like, it. Yeah, <laughs> let the guests wash over us. But um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Um, I think he is probably been the most anticipated episode when you replied it got instantly like 10,000 retweets or something um and i think a big part of it is our audience or the people that watch are um they're into crypto like often late cycle um and their uh role in crypto is a little bit more similar to gambling <laughs> than it is to like super long uh, time horizon kind of it goes up forever um they're making money to they're trading whatever not just bitcoin they're trading like whatever dog coin or uh, sonic coin um in order to make a bit of money so um you coming on as the there is no second best bitcoin only um i think is uh super interesting um to them um i'd love to ask on your bitcoin journey from you know uh, day one, hearing about it to, you know, where you are now and what, uh, what sort of changed throughout that time. And, um, yeah, your can, realizations, can I guess. we, can we start in a particular place with that? Because this is the first tweet that I know of with, uh, with you about Bitcoin and it was, uh, skeptical. Um, uh, so like that was 2013, but then, you know, obviously now you're, you're one of the biggest advocates out there. And, you know, I think a lot of us go through that skeptical to believer journey, but we definitely want to hear it. Yeah, um, I th if you roll the clock back uh, to the beginning of the decade, you know, I, I fancied myself a Twitter commentator. I would watch things in the tech space. And <laughs> you know how there are like these Twitter people and they post things and they get three likes and they think that <laughs> someone's noticing? Okay, so I was posting and I might get like 12 likes or eight likes and pr probably like half the people work for me that liked it. And I had opinions <laughs> about... All sorts of stuff. You know, I, I was um, a big tech enthusiast. I wrote a book called The Mobile Wave, published it in 2012. And, and uh, you know, and I was fascinated with the idea of what happens when software is dematerialized and starts running on a mobile device. And if you're sleeping with your software and it can wake you up, you know, how would that create a business opportunity, you know? And, and the mobile wave winners were like Facebook and Amazon and Apple and Google what can you do with a mobile phone? You're not going to book a hotel reservation on a PC, you know, but when you've got a mobile phone and you're out on a Saturday afternoon, then maybe you could actually do something commercial or communicative or, you know, et cetera. Um, so I, I tweet this and that. Uh, I'll say two things. One, I didn't even remember I tweeted this thing uh, when I actually announced we bought Bitcoin in, in 2020. All the Research. Bitcoiners, they <laughs> scoured everything I'd said in the history of the world and then bring this up. I'm like, did I say that? Wow. <laughs> I, I noticed Bitcoin once. I literally had forgot I'd ever said it, right? But, you, you know, got to give them credit that uh, the internet never forgets. But what I was thinking <clears throat> when I did tweet that was, 
you know, I'd watched, um, I'd watched all these online poker sites and, you know, and it, it was a great idea. And remember tradesports.com when you could bet, there used to be these prediction markets. I mean, there still are today. I think, uh, I think there's a love hate relationship. People would like to vote on who's going to win the Super Bowl and well, you know, which politician will win this and they'll get it started. And then the regulators will shut them down. <clears throat> and, um, so trade sports was like an online gambling site and then they had online poker sites and they were really big what happened by the way is i think like the indian casinos got together gave a lot of money to the southern baptist ministry that gave a lot of money to jack abramoff which and he went to lobby a bunch of politicians in dc to convince them that uh, gambling is an abomination in the eyes of god and the remedy was of course to outlaw the online uh, poker sites and allow the gambling and the Indian reservations in Vegas to continue. But they, they basically uh, pulled, uh, they stopped uh, banks from allowing you to wire money into trade sports and online gambling sites. And first they did that. And then they actually pulled the CEOs of those companies off their flights while passing through Dulles airport and arrested them. And that shut that business down. So, <laughs> so much, you know, we all, we all like to play poker. It was kind of fun and bet on who's going to win the next election or whether it's going to rain on Groundhog Day. It seemed fun, but it became non-compliant and it just went away. So at some point, I probably read some random thing about Bitcoin and, you know, it was being used for Silk Road or used for whatever. And I said, well, it looks like it's going to go the way of online gambling. Some some regulator will probably shut it down. And, and uh, I... It probably got like four likes, <laughs> you know, and, and OK, here's oblivious when you tweet something and nobody notices and you don't notice that nobody noticed. <laughs> right. There's a lot of Twitter influencers like that. Even today, people tweet some random thing and like they don't notice that nobody noticed or cared. I'm feeling but, called out here. <laughs> I, you know, so I did that for a long time and that was one of my tweets. Bottom line with Bitcoin is I didn't need it. I did. I didn't need it. It wasn't a problem. I was very. In, I, I had a solution. My solution to every world problem was oh, mobile. You know, Amazon, Apple Music, Apple Photos, mobile apps, Amazon. Apple's going to ship a, a a billion a product to a billion people overnight for a nickel and change the world. And you ought to buy Apple stock. I mean, that's my solution. Buy Apple stock, buy Amazon stock, buy whatever. And it works fine. And that's the mainstream. The mainstream big tech or the mainstream investor, if they were successful in that decade from 2000 to 2020, they entered in the big tech trade. Like 90% uh, of the gains in the S&P were like five companies. And if you, you know, and by the way, the, the, the tech, rev the revolutionary, the revolutionary was going on a Wall Street and saying you should buy Amazon or go into Wall Street and say, you should buy Apple, you know? And the mainstream investors would say, well, you know, if Apple stock doubles, we should just sell it and rebalance and we'll buy a bunch of other computer companies so you don't have too much risk. And they're like, well, if Amazon stock doubles, we should just sell it and buy some other retailers, you know, Toys R Us, whatever, something, not too much <laughs> risk. Okay, and, and my, you know, my view at that time, and it's still my view today is like, the problem with the the problem with diversification, diversification is selling the winner to buy the losers. One company in the retail space, Amazon wins. The second company, Walmart, kind of treads water. And fifteen thousand companies lose. They all lose. And with Apple, one company wins they get 150% of the profit in the industry. Every other company loses half as much as Apple makes or a third as much as Apple makes something to compete. And there are no winners, right? There, there is just one winner. There is a Apple. And the reason you don't want to sell the winner to buy the losers or the reason you don't want to diversify or portfolio balance is because the success of the one thing it eliminates the need for all the other things. And 
when that one thing is a digital network and it's a digital monopoly, when the one thing is a YouTube or the one thing is an Apple or an iOS or whatever, the problem is they can ship a piece of software that's crappy, like Apple TV, <laughs> Apple, Apple Music. They can ship a, anything that's mediocre average, but they can ship it to 300 million people with a marketing cost of a dollar. And they could ship it to a billion people over the weekend for the cost of the electricity, like a nickel. And everybody else has to, you know, like Peloton's got to manufacture a bunch of treadmills and put them in inventory. And, you know, they got to deal with real world issues. It's nearly impossible to beat the digital monopolies. So anyway, that my, my view was find the digital monopoly and ride the wave. The mobile wave was digital transformation of music and maps and relationships and communications and entertainment and video and television and books. And, you know, each of those companies made about a trillion dollars doing that, you know, fine. I didn't really see Bitcoin as a solution to my problem. If I, if I had all my assets in Argentina, all of them, if I, if I was a rancher in, in uh, Zimbabwe, <laughs> if I was a business person in Syria or Lebanon or whatever, I would have been more sensitive because when more than 50% of your net worth is at risk. If I tell you you're about to lose half of everything or all of everything in the next 12 months, or you watch it happen, all of a sudden you get religion. Um, I, I had just, I had my feathers singed. I had a taste of it. I lost a million dollars in a bank in Brazil when the head of the bank just stole the money. <laughs> I never got it back. So I, I saw that counterparty risk rug pull, but it was the conventional. Uh, <laughs> and then I, I lost a million dollars in Argentina. You know, when uh, the Argentine peso was one peso to the dollar, I, I, I literally remember when the, when the peso was one peso to the dollar, right? If you, if you Google blue dollar right now, you'll find it's like 210 pesos to the dollar or something. But I remember when it was one and I thought, no way am I trusting the peso with my money. I had like a big company that was selling business intelligence software in Argentina. So I had about a million dollars and I said, well, I don't trust Argentine, Argentine banks. Get me an American bank. You go, oh, oh my, ouch, painful. It was 209 a week ago, I swear to you, Ledger, and now it's 221. <laughs> Look at the official rate, yeah. 110. So they're not even that, recognizing the actual rate. The, the government will, you know, they're like, they, we think it's 110, but you have to come up with uh, 221 for a dollar if you want to actually get the dollar, yeah. right? They officially say you can put 110 pesos up for a dollar, but they don't have any dollars to sell you. It's capital <laughs> control, right? That, yeah. Anyway, uh, but coming back to that, so I have a million dollars. I say to my finance people, I say, I don't trust an Argentine bank. They're like, no problem. We're going to put it in Bank of America. Oh, Bank of America, I feel better about that. Bank of America, where? In Argentina. Okay, but it's the Bank of American branch in Argentina, and I don't trust the peso. Like, okay, no problem. We'll save it in the dollar. Okay. I said, well, can I get it out of the country? No. Capital control. We got to keep it there. Like, sure. Okay, no. So I go to sleep, and I wake the next week. It's like the, the finest people come into my office. They're like, well, you know, we got some bad news and some worse news. <laughs> What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is the government converted all of our uh, all of our pesos, uh, or all of our dollars to pesos, and the worst news is the pesos devalued ten to one. <laughs> it's like, so what do I have now? Like, well, you have a you have a hundred thousand pesos or something like that. <laughs> or like, I yeah, you are, no, you have a million pesos worth a hundred thousand dollars. I said, well, can I get it out of the country now? They're like, no, it's going to keep de de depleting. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so I, I had a little inkling of of this issue but at the end of the day 95 percent, 98 percent of our assets were in the western world and and it was just like a flesh wound so um you know incidentally by about 2017 if you pull up that chart again can you pull up the blue dollar chart and put it on the screen and you know you'll find there's a little thing that shows the the rate for like the last five years pull the uh look at the uh informal rate and pull up the chart there's a chart there yeah. <laughs> Reasonable. Okay. You, you want to uh, go to that chart in 2017. 
Can you read uh, what the, no, you you had it on, you had it on there, I think. Just, uh, can you can you see 36 months ago? Just put your cursor over it. Okay. Oh, you're sh okay, you're showing the 20 years. Like, it's pretty brutal, right? Yeah. But what's what's the rate around 2017? It was about uh, 20, under Okay, 20, yeah, 20, 20 pesos to the dollar. And I, I'm looking at it, I'm reading the press, and I'm like, I know I'm going to lose all my money in Argentina again. I know it's going to happen. I said, it's 20 pesos to the dollar, inflation rates 30 40% a year. I said, can we get the money out of Argentina? They go, well, no. I said, uh, can we just go buy like $2 million of gold? Like, and they're like, and carry it to the airport? It's like, we'll get arrested. No. Like, oh. <laughs> okay, no. I can't do that. I said, well, can we buy any, can we buy like a ranch or something in Argentina at least? Buy something tangible? Like, well, we can't, we don't want to own a ranch. I said, can you guys just go buy a yacht in Argentina? <laughs> and I want you to buy the yacht and I want you to float it to the Caribbean. <laughs> and then we'll sell it or we'll keep the... You know, and, I, and the the finance people and the lawyers came in my office to stage an intervention. Uh, <laughs> they're like, they're like, they they're trying. You know how when you have like your boss's boss or a very powerful person, and you want to tell them that no, they can't do something, but you're afraid that they're going to send you, so you come in with three other people as backup. Yeah. So it's like four people in my office, and I'm like, okay, I get it. This is like they're about to give me some really bad news. They're going to tell me that I just can't do it. I, like. I don't think there's anything illegal about buying a yacht in Argentina if you're a company. I, I didn't think it was illegal. I mean, what's illegal about buying a boat? Yeah. But uh, I guess they're concerned about a boating accident. Yeah. But, um, but you know, so I, I couldn't do that. And eventually I gave up. And <clears throat> yeah, our solution was some roundabout way. We bought some sovereign debt from the Argentine government that w where there's a law makes it illegal to, legal to buy the sovereign debt. You take a 20% haircut. And by the time you pay 20 or 30% fees, you know, you've lost like 30% of your money, but maybe you got some of the money out of the country and it's all kind of compliant. But that's my experience with that currency. If you fast forward to 2020, you know, when I discovered Bitcoin again, I had a problem. And at that point, the problem was half the market cap of the company was in dollars. I had a billion dollar market cap. I had 500 million in cash. The interest rate had gone to zero. It was going to stay at zero for four years. And uh, the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street had recovered with a K-shaped recovery. And I was staring at cash with a 0% yield and the S&P up 25% which means that I'm basically losing 25% of the purchasing power of the money. And, and I either have to just give back the $500 million. I, I mean, basically it, it's kind of like amputating your left arm and your left leg and, and, and attempting to run the race. It's like, you're an athlete, but we need to, you to like give up, you know, either two of your legs or an arm and a leg, and then you can hop in the race. It's either that or I better find out, I better find something to invest the cash in that's going to go up faster than the money pi supply expands. And hence, you know, we're back to, can I buy a boat with it? It's like, <laughs> I can't buy a boat. So can I buy, should I buy gold? Should I buy land? Can I buy a building? Can I buy a portfolio of real estate? Can I, should I buy baseball cards? What can I buy that's actually going to go up in value more than 20% a year and, and, you know, to make a long story short, we sifted through everything. We thought crypto gold was a good idea. We sifted through all the cryptos. We thought Bitcoin was the crypto gold. And we started on this journey. And there's a long story about how we finally got into our position we are today, where we got like $5 billion worth of it. We started to make a very short story. We, we started deciding we'll buy $250 million of, the, of Bitcoin and we'll give $250 million back to the shareholders in a buyback. The idea being that the shareholders thought we're spark, stark raving crazy and they wanted to get off the crazy train. They can sell their stock back at a, at a premium. And that's what helps you to avoid getting sued. Mm. Right? Because if I just did it and the stock traded down, then I immediately get a whole rash of shareholder lawsuits you know, alleging that I shouldn't have done it. 
but if we announce the the initiative along with the buyback, well, the stock's going to trade up because we're going to buy back the stock. And that way, it does a bunch of things. It's kind of prophylactic uh, from a shareholder relation point of view. It also rotates your shareholder base. Uh, and it also de-stresses the transition because instead of having, if I put out a, if I got put out a news release at nine o'clock in the morning where we just bought five hundred million dollars of Bitcoin, every investor has twenty-seven minutes to research Bitcoin <laughs> and then decide whether they like that or not. Now, how many people can figure out whether or not they want to own twenty million worth of Bitcoin in twenty-seven minutes on a Monday morning? Right? They go ballistic nuts. So you don't really want to surprise anybody. One of the rules of running a publicly traded company, a simple rule is no surprises. Be transparent, be very predictable, you know, tell them what you're thinking about, tell them you're thinking about, tell them how you're thinking about it, tell them how you thought it, you know, and make sure that it is utterly boring. So you do a tender offer, it's 20 days. Everybody's got 20 days to study it. And at the end of the 20 days, they can either tender their shares at a premium or they can stay all on board, you know, for the ride and they can uh, and, and they can be investors in the company. So that's kind of how we got into it. And I didn't really tweet much about Bitcoin uh, when we made the first announcement because we're in the middle of a Dutch auction and every investor has to decide whether they want to uh, buy or sell the stock or hold. Right. And it's a security and if you're if you're a public company officer of a security, if I do sherry duties and it's like if I made it look like I wanted them to sell into the tender, that's bad. If I made it look like I wanted them to not do it, it's bad. If you know, it's like I I just don't want to condition the market. Everybody's got to make their own decision. So we really didn't start to communicate until later, like after the tender offer expired. Then I started seeing some of these tweets where I had you know, said that Bitcoin was going to zero. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> I'm like, all of a sudden, there's like Twitter has come to life. If you, you had this experience for a decade where you tweet every single day for a decade and four people notice and you kind of it makes you a little bit. What is the word comfortable? Like, mm. like maybe you think you think no one's noticing so you could be a little bit more loose. Mm. <laughs> and then at some point people are noticing and you're like, you get the math wrong. And if you multiply by two numbers and you got, you're wrong in the third significant digit, you get excoriated. Yeah, they've got receipts on the internet. <laughs> I posted, I posted one tweet, you know, and I, you know, I, I posted a tweet by Gandhi and I spelled his name wrong. You know, I put the G H instead of a G A N D A, whatever. I had the H in the wrong place. And I tweeted it, and then within like 17 seconds, there's like four people that have like <laughs> lambasted me for spelling Gandhi's name wrong. And I'm like, oh crap, I have to fix this, or I'm not going to feel the end of it for the you know next so, many days. And so I'm like, I delete, read, <laughs> Google Gandhi, <laughs> copy paste you know, it. Like, you know, now you got to like you got to Google everything before you tweet it for the spell checker to check it. And Lord help you if you didn't have the apostrophe where you should have had the apostrophe. There's somebody is going to like rip you to shreds. But I guess that's why we love them all, eh? So when did you I like I like the idea that someone saw a tweet about like Gandhi talking about Bitcoin and they focused on the spelling of his name. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he didn't say that. It was like he spelled his name wrong though. <laughs> Well, a lot of times people go, hey, Gandhi did not endorse Bitcoin. I'm like, Dude. I have a, I, um, obviously, everybody really? knows that you're like incredibly bullish on Bitcoin, hardest money, biggest network effects, all those things. Bitcoin is energy and we're all cyber hornets and what I, I can't remember all the memes. Um, what I would like to know is when did owning Bitcoin under a corporate umbrella change from I want to maintain the buying power of the cash that we manage within our company to we're going to buy absolutely all the Bitcoin we possibly can <clears throat> with, you know, cash, debt instruments, whatever the hell is out there. Like if we can get our hands on Bitcoin, we want our hands on Bitcoin. Like when did that conversion occur? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, story. In, in the second quarter of 2020, the K-shaped recovery hit. And what I said was, if you're on Main Street, this is the worst year of your life in 30 years. There's nothing worse than this. If you're manufacturing products with people and providing goods and services in the real world. 
But if you, but the K shaped recovery meant that if you're on Wall Street, you had a 30% gain in your portfolio. <laughs> And the, and the average S&P index was up 10% a year for 100 years and is up 30% in one year. So Wall Street had the best year of their life. Main Street had the worst year of their life. I'm sitting in the, in the middle and I'm saying, I got a massive problem. I'm, obviously, I'm missing something. We can't, keep, we can't keep going where it's like we're rowing six miles an hour against a 30-knot wind. This is not going to work. So the first Bitcoin buy that we announced in August, that was defensive. That was, I either have to do this or I get stripped of all my capital. And if I lose my financial capital, my stock's trading not at 120 bucks, it'll be trading at 60 bucks a share. If it's trading at 60 bucks a share, the stock options are underwater. The RSUs are underwater. Microsoft and Amazon and Google and Apple target all my employees. You know, my top line shrinking, my turnover is going to double, right? We're kind of, we're headed toward a death spiral if we give the capital back. If we hold the capital, it's dead money on the balance sheet, losing 20%. So I'm going to lose $100 million in, in shareholder value and make 50 or $75 million a year. So I'll work for the next decade, but make no progress. Just... I'm just rowing against the wind that's blowing harder than I can row. So I figured uh, better to take a risk than, have a, than suffer either a fast death. Giving up the capital is kind of a speedy death. Keeping the capital is a slow death. Do something, take a risk is a chance at life. So, <clears throat> so I figured better to take a risk. It's defensive. And the first purchase in August was $250 million. You know, and I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we get fifty dollars a share in Bitcoin? But I, but our first buy was about twenty-five dollars a share in Bitcoin, about ten million shares outstanding. And then the Dutch auction. Well, I didn't know what would happen. I mean, for all I know, if if the shareholders hated Bitcoin, we would have got hit with two hundred fifty million dollars of redemptions, and then that's all we would have. But as it turns out, the Dutch auction resulted in sixty million dollars in redemptions and one hundred and seventy-five million in free capital. So at that point, you know, we meet as a board and we think, well, we've got extra capital. We've already come halfway. We might as well adopt this as the primary reserve asset. And so we did that. Then we bought 175 million more Bitcoin. It wasn't easy because we bought that first tranche. Bitcoin was trading like 11,600. Yeah. In that 20 days, it traded down to 10,000. Okay. So, so. And in, in that first 20 days, I'm getting beat on pretty hard. You know, you, you moron, you've lost $40 million or something. People kind of make fun of me today on Twitter. Like, Michael said, oh, I lost all this money. Or like, it's not my first time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, take a ticket, stand in line. This, <laughs> this is like not the first time a trade has gone against me. So, so the, the actual courageous decision I think was the second decision because the second time around we were putting $175 million in. And, and I think that purchase was like 10,400 a coin. It was, yeah. So we were actually doubling down after the market moved 10% against us, but you know, it is what it is. And so that's stage one defensive. And uh, what happened next is the stock traded up. And then all of a sudden the stock traded up to the 10 year high. And so for 10 years, we'd never gotten above $200 a share and we went into 200s and we went into the 300s. And um, at that point, you know, we we were generating cash. We bought Bitcoin with some cash. You know, some of the employees were exercising some stock options. We generated cash from stock option issuance. We bought some Bitcoin with that. And, um, and you know, the equity markets were pretty strong. The convertible market was strong. And we thought, well, maybe we can actually raise money in a convertible debt offering. And uh, so we came out, we offered, uh, we offered a $400 million debt offering. Well, you know, the stock's trading in like 300 or something, you know, we couldn't have raised $400 million at that level at any other time in 10 years. So we thought, we'll offer that. Bitcoin traded up a, a lot and our stock was up and we had an opportunity. So we upsized the deal 
we priced it at the low end of the range. We were able to basically make the deal a $650 million deal at 75 basis points, like three quarters of 1% interest. And uh, it was a 37% premium, which is the high end of the range, which meant that in essence, the strike was $398 a share. Now, keep in mind that a few weeks earlier, our stock was trading $90 a share. And when we announced this strategy, our stock was $120 a share. So we're in essence, we're raising money at not quite four times, but almost four times that price. And at that point, I call that opportunistic. It's like, why did you raise the $650 million at less than 1% interest? Well, cause like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> why, uh, yeah, why wouldn't you? Like if someone wanted to give you a $650 million loan to invest in anything you wanted to invest it in for less than 1% interest, would you take the money? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're, we're opportunistic at that point, you know, and like, I think, I think in the, in the offering, you know, they said, well, are you going to buy Bitcoin with it? And I just said, yeah, yeah I'm going to buy Bitcoin with it. Or like, and so we went back and forth over, well, is it for general corporate purposes or to, or to buy Bitcoin? And we eventually said something like, we're going to buy Bitcoin with it and then hold it for general corporate purposes if we want it in the future. So we're at the stage where we're an enterprise software company you know, and our, and our market cap is up and we've got this interesting treasury reserve strategy. And, and it went from a treasury investment to a treasury reserve strategy to an opportunistic capital raise. <clears throat> then what happened next is by the time we got to like uh, February, you know, Bitcoin caught fire. You remember what happened? Like it went to all time high. So we bought $650 million of Bitcoin around 19,000 or 20,000. I don't remember exactly, but people said, you're crazy. You're buying at the all time high. Well, okay, let, let me just say for the record, guys, I'm going to be buying at the all time high forever. Like, <laughs> you know, if the company's in business 30 years, then every year for the next 30 years, there's going to be a point at which I'll be buying at an all time high. You know, <laughs> the haters are like, they're like, blah, blah, blah. You bought some at 57 or 49 or whatever. They always conveniently forget that I also bought 175 million worth of it below 10,000. <laughs> Like they leave that part out, right? <laughs> they always remember the other part. Um, but, you know, every year forever, if you just focus upon the last six months, you're going to be able to find someone buying something at the all-time high. So we bought this at the all-time high. No, I was like, what was the all-time high to date? I mean, at some point, the world changes. I have, I have views of, you know, the future, and the future includes things that have not yet occurred, and the future includes things that didn't happen in the past. And so, right, uh, the all-time high is just the all-time high to date. So we bought, and, this, and Bitcoin just kept trading up, you know? We probably bought a bunch at, at 19,000. You remember it was 25,000 by Christmas, it was 30,000 by New Year's Day, and then it went on this run. That convertible bond that we sold, that was the best performing bond of the year of every bond <laughs> sold by any company in the world. <laughs> okay, the, the people that bought that bond like tripled their money or something. Like it, it traded up, it, it tripled, right? And they doubled their, they got a 200% return in like six weeks. So I mean, it, was a, it was a screaming home run. So, um, you know, because the strike was 398, our stock ended up going to 1,000. Bitcoin was screaming. Like, you know, you, you can go do the math, but. So at that point, we had a chance to go back to the market and we thought, well, maybe we could do it again. Okay, our stock hit $1,000 a share. So we went back, we did a convert, and we started this time at 600 million and we upsized it to 900 million or something. And we exercised the green shoe and it was a $1 billion, $50 million capital raise. <clears throat> And uh, the range of coupon was zero to 50 basis points. So we priced it at zero, like zero interest. And the range of the premium was 37 to 50 and, or 37 to 47 or something. And so we were at the high end of the range. So the short, the short story there is, so we essence 
we raise a billion fifty million dollars with a strike price of fourteen hundred thirty two dollars a share. Now you remember what my bottom was? It was like ninety dollars a share. You remember what my tender price was? It was one hundred and forty dollars a share. In September, people were giving the stock back to us at one hundred and forty dollars a share because they thought we were crazy. <laughs> and we turned around. We sold a billion dollars at fourteen hundred thirty two dollars a share. Now, why? Because why wouldn't you? Again, like, why? If someone said, "Okay, what business are you in?" Blah blah blah. Well, would you like a billion dollars for the next six <laughs> years for free to invest in that business? Well, yeah. I mean, why would? You? So at that point, I I don't know if it was before or after, but in the February time frame. We had to file our 10K. A public company files an annual report. And in the annual report, it's audited. And it's pretty serious document. The single most serious document you file every year is the 10K. And in the 10K, we had to address this issue. Is this a treasury strategy? Is it opportunistic? Is it defensive? Or is it strategic? And that's the point where we turned the corner and we said, you know, we're not just a, if you go back and you look at my first CNBC interview, you know, Melissa Lee said, well, are you a software company or a hedge fund? I'm like, well, we're a software company. And uh, six months later, we said, well, what are you? And, and the answer is, well, we really are two things now. We've got two business strategies. We're a business intelligence company and we're selling enterprise software. And we got 30 years experience. It's a $500 million a year business. It's growing zero to 10% a year. It's going to generate 50 to 100 million in cash flow a year. It's profitable. That's what we are. We love it. We'll keep doing it. Uh, but, you know, you can't really scale it. Like if you gave me a billion dollars, I couldn't just go hire 10,000 more people and make it 10 times bigger. Like uh, you can't scale it with labor. You can't scale it with capital. We're not a monopoly. We're not, we're not Google or Facebook or Amazon or Apple. I can't just, you know, buy a, a music service and bundle it on 18 billion devices, right? I, I have to go and knock on doors and sell things. So that is like your main street company. We provide services and products that take a lot of effort to people that value them. And we're very proud of what we do. But the other strategy was the Bitcoin strategy. And the Bitcoin strategy, we thought long and hard about it. It's acquire and hold Bitcoin, pure and simple. Not trade, not, not anything else, just acquire and hold Bitcoin. It's like acquire and hold property, right? Uh, it, it might evolve sometime in the future to be something more sophisticated, but acquiring, holding Bitcoin seemed like a reasonable thing to do. And it became proactive at that point. And we set it in black and white. We said, if you're buying the company, then you're buying a company that's going to acquire and hold Bitcoin. And it's going to build and sell and market enterprise business intelligence software. And we do our best to disclose all the risk factors and all the costs and how we do it. And um, with regard to acquire and hold Bitcoin, it's like, how are you going to do it? Well, by any means that is accretive, and accretive is a very uh, a powerful word, but I, you know, are you going to do it with equity? Are you going to do it with debt? Are you going to do it with cash flows? Are you going to do it with convertible debt? Well, you know, it all depends upon the terms and conditions and the risks associated with the financing. And it's pretty obvious if I generate 50 million in cash flow and I buy Bitcoin with it, that's accretive. So yeah, I'm going to do that, but we may do other things. And I, so I would say that that's the journey. In August, it's defensive. In December, it's opportunistic. By March, February to March, it's become strategic. You said, um, you said, you know, uh, I bought the all-time high, and I'll buy future all-time highs over the next thirty years. You know, I'm I'm just buying nonstop. How do you think about the um? The, I guess historically cyclical nature of uh, of the markets, where I've been in crypto since 2012 or so, so I've sat through three horrendous, uh, soul crushing uh, bear markets of it just being down only and me losing my sanity a little bit. Um, and um, I've also sat through some of the most euphoric up only uh, years over the <coughs> last decade. Um, 
is your strategy you just don't give a shit you're buying no matter what like periodically yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but but i have a more articulate answer um first of all we're an institution so the life expectancy of an institution is forever like if, if you're a company right the the company will transcend it will last past me right i'm not a family right the you know the life expectancy of a family depends upon you know it depends upon the family it might be 100 years it might be 10 years right it might it might be you're a solo dude and you're thinking i just need to have a lambo in 3 years and nothing else matters but a lambo or or whatever um institutions have a longer time horizon uh, the second is we're a profitable institution. So uh, we don't, ha we don't, uh, if you're an individual and you were trading in crypto and you needed to pay your bills and you worried about health insurance or you got married and you had kids and you want to put your kids in and you want to get a house or buy a car, well, you have near term cash requirements. MicroStrategy generates cash, right? We will, when we came down this path, we concluded we would always generate cash. And, and the reason we concluded this, Kobe, is, is there's a massive digital transformation and we realized that no amount of throwing money at sales and marketing will actually grow our business. <clears throat> we couldn't throw money at it if we wanted to. We tried it. Like I, it's advantageous to be in business 30 years. Like I've gone through a period where I'm like, I'm going to hire 400 engineers. I'm going to go spend $20 million on marketing trade shows. I'm going to go spend, tw I spent $20 million on ads on Facebook and LinkedIn, ask me whether they work. I'm guessing no, but did they work? No, <laughs> <laughs> they don't work. They don't work. Like, uh, you know, like I, I've spent $500,000 for two days of a trade show. You know, I, I, you know, I, I've done, I've been there. I've done all that stuff. So I got to the point where I realized that we really couldn't throw money and capital at the, at the core business and make it grow. We had a cash cow. And, uh, and the problem with the cash cow, by the way, is if the money supply is expanding at 10% a year, which is what it was from 2010 to 2020, if your top line and your cash flows don't grow more than 10% a year, your stock will tank. So the only way to avoid your stock tanking, if you want your stock to be a store of value, you have to grow your cash flow per share greater than the rate of the monetary inflation. This is why Amazon works. Amazon, Google, Facebook grow 20%. That's why they work. This is why Apple bought a lot of their stock back and leveraged up, right? If you can't grow your top line, you either do acquisitions. This is why Oracle bought a lot of companies. Your choices are you have a monopoly and you grow your top line 20% or you do a bunch of acquisitions or you leverage up or you sell out. Those are your four choices. So imagine if I can't grow 20%, I got a problem. But what happens when the inflation rate goes to 20% and you can't grow 30%? Okay, at, at that point, it's pretty hopeless. So um, I, I kind of realized that I had a good business but as a public company, it's dead money because the investor's view is they, they want you to grow faster than the hurdle rate or, or they just rather you roll over and die. It's like, it, you know, if, if your, your, your father or mother was a doctor and they had a practice and they were doing good business and delivering babies and saving lives, you know, and, and the inflation rate is 25%. And you said, you know, mom, dad, are you going to raise your prices 25% this year? Like, no, no, my customers can't pay 25% more. Okay, so roll over and die. Well, like, uh, what? So I got to like roll up the business and end it? Like, uh, there, you know, there's something in our society, right? Where I think it's pretty obvious that you probably need doctors and dentists, even if they can't grow their companies 25%. You need them. But somehow in the public market, the public investors are of the view that if your company can't grow 25%, you're worthless. And so, so there's a dichotomy. And you can see, you can see that if the, the central bankers crank up the inflation rate from 3% to 7% to 10% to 15% to 20%, what you're doing 
is you're tilting the playing field in favor of the monopolies and the manufacturing businesses against the small businesses and the manufacturers and the craftsmen. And, you know, and eventually you're just destroying anybody that's not highly automated and highly capital intensive. And, you know, I saw it viscerally, 99% of my competitors went out of business. Well, you know, I, I am literally the last man standing in my industry. Like you, you might go check. I don't think there's, there's no CEO in the enterprise software business that stayed in their job, you know, longer than me. 99 out of 100 CEOs in my industry went out of business. The companies that I compete against gone. And people think, oh, it's just competition. Well, it's partially competition, but it's partially monetary policy. So, um, you know, coming back to this entire issue, I, I, I kind of was aware that um, that wasn't going to work. And I couldn't, I, I didn't need the capital. I was going to generate cash. And, um, you know, and you're saying, well, how do I view the volatility? Well, I've got a cash cow. And um, what I need to be is I need to be an asset rich company. <clears throat> because if you're an asset rich company with property or some kind of assets, then um, it's kind of like uh, putting up a sail. Like you're in a boat, you're in a rowboat, you're rowing at seven knots. The wind is blowing against you seven knots. You're not going anywhere. Then the wind is blowing against you 14 knots. You're going backwards. At that point, you have this uh, realization that you're never going to get to your destination and you're going to die at sea. It's like that guy. It's a sad story. Right? I don't know if you noticed the guy that was trying to row across the Atlantic last week and he died. You know, it's very sad. But the problem is if you can't outrow the current or outrow the wind, then you're never gonna, you're going to die. And uh, so I'm in a rowboat uh, corporately, and the wind, figuratively speaking, metaphorically speaking, is the monetary inflation rate. So you can keep working harder, you know, like the horse and animal farm or whatever, just keep working harder till your heart beats, the heart breaks, or you can do something. And the something is you put up a $250 million crypto sale. Okay, and then you make it a $425 million crypto sale. <clears throat> and so now I got a $500 million sale. If you have a $500 million sale and the monetary inflation rate's 20%, you're gonna get a $100 million shareholder gain a year. <laughs> and, and so at that point, you can see if I had 500 million in cash yielding zero and I generate 100 million in cash flow and if the inflation rate's 20%, then the 100 million in accretion is offset by the 100 million in dilution on the balance sheet. And in essence, 2,000 people row as hard as they can to go nowhere. Yeah, you're just treading water. Yeah. Right? On the other hand, when I flip the 500 million in cash to 500 million in Bitcoin, at that point, if Bitcoin trades up 20%, 30%, right? Now I've got 100 million plus 100 million. Now I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Right now I've got 200 million in accretion instead of zero in accretion. And at that point, you go borrow another 500 million. If you go short the dollar, you borrow 500 million and now you've got a billion dollar crypto sale. Now the 20% inflation rate generates 200 million a year. Put another 100 million on top of it, you generate 300 million a year in, in uh, shareholder gains. Divided by 10 million shares, you got $30 a share. Now you can have a $300 or $600 stock, right? <clears throat> so so I, I, um, I was aware of the volatility, but now, let me put you back in the ocean. You're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You're going to die because you're rowing. <laughs> and somebody says, hey, I got an idea to save our lives. We'll put up a sail, and then we're going to turn and tack with the wind, and we're going to sail with the wind. And someone else says, you know, the wind is kind of gusting, you know, sometimes <laughs> the wind goes away and sometimes it turn, changes direction and we're going to have to continually trim the sails and we might like occasionally shred a sail. It's like, yeah, but I want you to roll back the clock and try to figure out whether, you know, the new world would have been discovered on ships with no sails. Like it's, it's like, you're not getting anywhere without using the wind. I mean, do 
you know, the history of the DuPonts, right? The DuPonts came to America because um, they're fa- they're Hug- they were Huguenots, I think, and they couldn't own property and they were run out of the country and they had no, po- they had no future. So they decide to come to America. They get in a sailing ship. It's supposed to take like six weeks. Captain gets lost, you know? It takes 12 weeks. They run out of food. Everybody's half starving to death. You know, it's like people think they take all this for granted, like this is easy. No, I mean, people that came to wherever they came to Australia, America, wherever it was, it was never easy. I mean, they were dying along the way, right? The mortality rate from Amsterdam to Australia is like 30% each way. 100 people get on a boat, 30 people die before you reach your destination. It's like, it did not used to be easy, but that's with the sale. And so you can say, well, were you afraid of the volatility? Well, I was certain I was going to die <laughs> with the row, with the rowing. And so, or I was going to get tossed on a stormy sea of fate. And my view is better get tossed around by the stormy seas of fate than a certain death in a rowboat. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's what I think about that. I'll, I'll make one more point on the future. <laughs> you know, if you want to model any given system, if it's a, if it's an adiabatic system, it's a closed system. It's like a, a wind tunnel. You know, it's one of those, <clears throat> it's a, it's a tank, you know, that you're using to test your hull designs. If the energy is, is completely predictable and controllable, and there are no new sources of energy, there are no uncontrolled variables. And if you run the experiment 10,000 times, you can probably find some resonating frequency and you can find some patterns and, there, and it becomes predictable, right? Like vibration, it's predictable, you know, exchange of forms of energy in a closed system. But as I said before, if Godzilla shows up to the kid's playground, then all of your models, they're all irrelevant and broken. It is true that, you know, it, it's, it's totally true that if I, do, if I deal you double aces, then you have an advantage in the poker game. But if I take out a gun and point it at your head and say, give me your goddamn money, the double aces don't give you an advantage in the poker game anymore, right? The point is the system change <clears throat> there are new developments. And so I think the people that have lived in crypto industry for the last decade, they lived through a very difficult time. And I respect that, you know, and, and their lessons are their lessons. And, and you should respect them for what they, what they learned. But just because you lived through the first decade of the industry doesn't mean that you can draw upon solely your experiences and your data sets to extrapolate the second decade of the industry, right? You, you know, you fought wars with bows and arrows and spears your entire life. And I show up with a bunch of dudes with machine guns and then you, you want to call the battle strategy. And the point is you're fighting the last war. And like, there are, there are elements of what you learned in the past decade that are relevant. But let's, you know, let's point, <clears throat> let's just deal with uh, the elephant in the room here, which is if you look at Bitcoin and you look at all the other cryptos, there's a crypto economy. It's got its own future. It's very complicated and murky. We could talk about it for three hours. It's, there's com- competitive issues, security issues, regulatory issues, nation state issues, complicated. Then there's Bitcoin, a digital property on a dominant network. It doesn't need any of the other crypto, whatever, to be successful. For Bitcoin to be successful, there are are any of 10,000 entities. The Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia, the Qataris, the the Emiratis, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Every public investor, every macro investor, every large company on earth, any municipality, any state, any government, any, there's 10, 20,000 people, they go to sleep tonight, they could wake up tomorrow morning and they could say, hmm, I think Bitcoin looks like crypto gold. I'm going to go ahead and put 3% of my portfolio in it. That means I'm going to buy $4 billion of it. 
I'm going to buy four or five billion dollars of it. It's nothing to me. It's nothing. It's like, a, you know, figure out how important 2% of your money is. It's like that deal. It's like, I noticed it. I'm going to put two, 3% of my assets into it. We'll see where it goes. LFG. And they put the news really out on the wire. And uh, Bitcoin doubles or triples. And then, you know, if, if the sovereign wealth fund of some Middle Eastern state did it, if they bought $5 billion, these people have $500 billion. Like the, the intelligent sovereign wealth funds, they're not, you know, the central banks of smart countries, they're not sitting on a bunch of uh, long dated T-bills. They're not holding a bunch of sovereign debt. They're holding Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google. You know, it's like it's the day that uh, that a Warren Buffett gets up and he says to some dude that works for him, I got 50 billion, figure out something to invest it in. And the dude says, oh, well, we bought 10 billion dollars with Apple and then Apple triples. And Warren Buffett made more money on Apple stock, which was a delegated decision by a dude. He made more money on Apple stock than he made in his entire life. And he's acknowledged to be like maybe one of the most successful investors of the last hundred years. And yet the thing he made the most money on was like an afterthought. So, so back to the, what does this mean to Bitcoin? It's like some dude with a $400 billion balance sheet can delegate to a portfolio manager to look at this thing. And that portfolio manager can say, I'm going to put 2% into it. And if, if you pick up the, paper and you read that the sovereign wealth fund of such and such state bought five billion worth of it what happens is the next five countries they think they'll put five billion into it and then what happens next is somebody at google will say i guess we can hold five billion of it and then somebody at goldman sachs or morgan Stanley will say i guess we probably should grab some and then ray dalio with his 50 billion or 100 billion or 150 billion dollars Okay, well, I guess instead of like half a percent, maybe 3%. Okay, and then all of a sudden Bitcoin spends from 40,000 to 150,000, 200,000. And I guess what I'm telling you is there's 10,000 people that could make $5 billion in 30 days if they wanted to bend over and pick up the money without taking a risk. And it's, it's literally like they might just notice you. They haven't really noticed you yet. And um, that being the case, you know, Kobe, everything you know for the past 12 years, right? And I, I was listening to the Kobe broadcast, but, but it's like four hours long, by the way. <laughs> it's the longest stinging long? podcast. Like, and, and to your credit, guys, I didn't want to speed it up because I was kind of enjoying the banter. So like, if I, was, <laughs> if I was just in it to cherry pick some facts, I would have watched it at 2x speed. But, but <laughs> you know, I kind of enjoyed it. So I got like halfway through it. I haven't got all the way through it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I don't, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I learn it the hard way when I get beat up by the Hornets about, you know, being <laughs> oblivious to the New York agreement or the block size wars or something. So, uh, you know, I'm still learning. But at the end of the day, you know, the future is going to be determined in part by the past. And in part, it, part of it is what the crypto industry thinks and does. But a lot of it is a function of what one, re one regulator could get up tomorrow and put out a press release that would double the market. Um, you know, any politician, there's, there's probably 200 politicians. There's, there's 10,000 big companies. There's 10,000 big institutional investors. There's 10,000 big governmental entities. Here's the big idea. The things at a tipping point, you don't need them all to agree. You just need anybody to agree. All you need is one, two, three. One will tip five, will tip 25. And then you spin up by an order of magnitude. So <clears throat> when will that happen? I don't know. Like, is it an if? It's not an if, it's a when. It, it will happen because... I can't really imagine that we live in a world where 30,000 people don't want billions of dollars of money. Like sometimes I'll, I'll talk to these big investors and, I'm, and they'll say, well, what's, what's this thing with Bitcoin? I say, well, it's digital properties, the dominant global digital asset network. And, and it's a lever 
And here's here's the reason it's better than credit or bonds or real estate. <clears throat> here's how it fits in your portfolio. And they're like, ah, I got to think about it some more. And I try to always be very polite, but in the back of my head, like I'm like, you have $25 billion in your portfolio and you generated 2% yield last year, which is downright <laughs> embarrassing because the S&P was up 25% and a freaking robot could have got 10x what you got. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, you must not like money that much. <laughs> like, like, I'm listening to you. I'm telling you, take a billion, take 2 billion, buy Bitcoin, put out a press release, explain why you bought it and wait, and you're going to double your money. It, you must not like money, right? Like, <laughs> because it would take you, I don't know, not that long. It's not easy to make billions of dollars. It's not easy. But um, there is one easy way, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's easy way. And uh, it, it all comes down to what's your balance sheet, right? It, it used to be that someone with $50 million could lean on it. <clears throat> you saw our impact. We started with $500 million. We really started with 250 million in capital that we could invest. And so now we're up to 5 billion. But what happens when someone comes in starting with 5 billion? Right? And I, I think that uh, the future, the future is, is a function of what everybody else in the world does. And there's a lot of people that have a vested interest in discovering this. This is a solution to a lot of problems. It's a, it's a big tech solution. If you're Apple, you can take your market cap up by $2 trillion. Okay, so does someone at Apple wanna make $2 trillion? Presumably, I, you know, I, there are certain, you know, there are certain uh, big tech players that will remain nameless or even exchanges. I'm like, yeah, certain exchanges that will remain nameless, you know, you take a billion dollars, you buy Bitcoin, you put it out on the wire, Bitcoin trades up, your stock trades up. Right. So there are a lot of big tech companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, to just name a few. They could make a hundred billion to a trillion dollars. <clears throat> will they? Not all of them, but somebody will. You've got all the nation states. Let's take uh, Turkey. The, the Turkey could print a billion dollars worth of lira by a billion dollars of Bitcoin and denominated in lira, double the price of Bitcoin in lira, right? It's like, it's a simple trade. In the Emirates, they could just buy a billion, 10 billion of Bitcoin with DRAM, right? They have their own currency. <laughs> Take your own currency, convert it into property. It's a reflexive trade. It doesn't work for the last entrant to the market, but it works for the first 5%. So it's an, it's an obvious trade um, for a nation state. It's an obvious trade for um, any, um, any company, like a company. Let's take my company. What did I do? Well, first I took existing cash and I bought Bitcoin. Then I borrowed money and bought more Bitcoin. Why was I able to borrow the money? I was able to borrow the money because the stock traded up because I bought the Bitcoin, right? So buying the Bitcoin drove the stock, opened up the opportunity to borrow the money, opened up more opportunities. And in the third and the fourth quarter, we sold a billion dollars worth of stock. We sold a billion dollars of stock, you know, blended $700 a share. You remember what the stock was at when I started the journey? Okay, so what's going on is I'm backing the equity of the company with an asset which is stronger than a currency. The equity trades up, all the securities of the company trade up, and then I borrow money to buy the uh, buy back into the balance sheet. So today, you know, say what you will, we're sitting on five billion dollars or one hundred twenty-four thousand Bitcoin, right? Which is an asset as opposed to having a liability. And we got there in 18 months. We got there from August to today, right? About 18 months. P you know, you could do the same thing with a country because a currency of a country is like the stock of a company. And if you are a municipality, like a, a mayor, the mayor of New York, you know, if you go check New York municipal debt, they can borrow money at 1% interest. 
New York could go borrow a billion dollars. I mean, here's the real Bitcoin bond. You borrow a billion dollars at 1% interest, you buy Bitcoin. Better idea? You borrow $10 billion at 1% interest, you buy $10 billion of Bitcoin. So do this thought experiment. What would happen if you woke up and you read a press release from the mayor of New York saying, we just issued $5 billion of, of debt and we're going to buy Bitcoin with it to fix the balance sheet of New York City. What do you think would happen to the price of Bitcoin? I, whatever happens, I get liquidated, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a lot of questions. That was a solid hour of my. I do think only. Uh, I do think I do think the second second person. You know, like El Salvador did it, and now there's rumors of Honduras and Guatemala and Brazil, um, and uh, you know, you spoke to a lot of CFOs and CEOs over the last year. I'm sure. I do think the second person is a very underappreciated form of leadership because it turns the first person who goes out and there and does something from being like a lone wolf that looks a little bit crazy into okay, now there's two and then all of a sudden three is uh, a crowd and it's a, a trend and lots of people can do it. So um, I, I do think that's a, a very salient uh, uh, point. And I, I think I agree with you. That it, there's no doubt that happens over the next sort of uh, five years or so. Sorry, Ledger, what were you saying? While we're on the second, second person subject, give credit to Jack Dorsey. Oh yeah, true. Because after MicroStrategy announced a major Bitcoin buy, it was Square that announced yeah. the second one. And I think they kicked off the bull run. Yeah. And Tesla bought as well, didn't they? But then Elon's been flip floppy. He started, yeah. And then he started like, <laughs> so tweeting that's, about a, third, dog, that's dog a third coins. person story. <laughs> he talk, tweeted about dog coins all the time. So I don't know yeah. if he counts. Um, but I was thinking more about the countries because El Salvador went and there's been rumors, I guess, for the last year about um, other Latin American countries. Um, and I, I think that materializes soon. I know Max, um, spoke about it a little bit on television the other day. Um, anyway, Ledger, you were saying something. So I think at baseline, your, your bet, your ability to stay afloat depends on the network effects being um, value add. So more companies, nation states, et cetera, buying in, growing the network effects of, of Bitcoin and also the, the digital scarcity kind of playing out in the long run which is also based on network effects, not based on some kind of proprietary software advantage because it's open source software. Um, my, my question for you, and I think that's a good bet. That makes a lot of sense to me. And your, your top job, therefore, as one of the largest holders of Bitcoin is to convince other people to become large holders of Bitcoin because that increases those network effects by orders of magnitude when it's large entities that are buying into that concept uh, and have the ability to flip gold and whatnot. You talked earlier about companies that have the ability to have a, uh, create a monopoly. So on, um, you know, with, with Facebook, it's social or with Apple, it's, uh, it, you know, hardware and software. And with Amazon, it's probably operational fulfillment as much as anything, these different concepts. And my question for you is a little bit of a challenge towards the Bitcoin maximalism, which is, is there a window for monopolies to exist within the crypto ecosystem <coughs> on multiple fronts. So if Bitcoin is as a store of value or for money, is there a world where Ethereum can have a monopoly on crypto-based compute to the degree that it would actually incentivize you to kind of repeat this gamble or diversify, but with another potential monopolistic asset? Okay. The most important thing for any crypto investor long term to understand, I think, <clears throat> is um, the regulatory treatment, the the political status of every single crypto asset. And <clears throat> you got to start by defining what's a cryptocurrency, what's a crypto property, what's a crypto security, what's a crypto platform. And um, as far as I can see, Bitcoin is a crypto property. And by property, it means it's viewed as a fair, common piece of property beyond the control of a company or a group of individuals. It has to be para pursue to land or soybeans or gold or food, <clears throat> you know, some commodity. In order to create uh, a crypto property, it's pretty challenging, right? The Bitcoin story is 
Satoshi disappeared. The coins never moved, you know, from January 3rd of 2009 to like May 22nd of 2010. The price was like a penny, less than a penny on pizza day. It's a couple of pennies or something. <clears throat> there's no pre-mine. There's no ICO. There's proof of work. It's a fair distribution. There's no yield. And no one's investing in it with a with an expectation of profit. Now you can have debate over all these things, you know, for long periods of time. But it, I think it's pretty clear that of everything in the crypto universe, the thing that is most likely to be deemed property in any given nation state is Bitcoin, and I think we've seen that. I think that. Uh, You've then got a handful of other cryptos where you could debate whether they are property or not property, and it goes on for a while. The best claim would be the Bitcoin forks. And uh, then you move on. You've got, you've got an interesting story of ETH, very interesting story, and then you've got all the other crypto coins. I think that if you, you – know, I'm very sensitive to this because I've been a public company CEO since 1998. So I know the securities law reasonably well. <clears throat> Probably I know it better than most anybody in the crypto industry because I, there aren't very many crypto companies that have come public, right? If you if if you go public and you live through that and you understand um, public uh, securities laws that revolve around everything you can and cannot do, what you can say, what you cannot say, for example. If you parse everything I've said in the past 18 months, you will not see me utter ever that I thought that you should buy MSTR. I have never endorsed my own stock. I've never uttered an opinion of my own stock. You can go on Twitter and, you know, you can trash, you know, MSTR to the cows come home. I'm not going to defend it. I'm not going to say anything. I have no comment. It's a security. It's a security. I have civil liability, criminal liability, right? If you lie about a security, right? If you inadvertently lie, if you tell the truth as you understood it, but it turns out not to be the truth, right? Six years later, you find yourself in court defending it. So securities are a different creature altogether than property. And I think that... <clears throat> If you look at Bitcoin, it is the dominant digital property network. The other forks, you know, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, they're less than 1% now. If you have a <clears throat> if you have a similar property network, if it's global non-sovereign store of value, if that's the use case, if that's the design, which is what Bitcoin is, then I think information theory, thermal the law of thermodynamics, the law of marketing, the law of politics says all the energy tends to collapse into the dominant network in that space. Classic, classic uh, business strategy says that whatever your market is, you need to dominate that market, whatever it is. And if you can bring the overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming, over, overbearing amount of assets to bear in a given market, you'll crush everybody else. And there's one winner. The only way that you can win if you don't have that overwhelming uh, support is you have to segment the market. You have to find a very different segment for which you can be the best solution. Yeah. So <clears throat> that takes us to everything else. Well, if you parse the words of the regulators and if you look at the law, I can't find any reading of the law that indicates that anything else is other than a security. If, it's a, if it uses a coin to stake, every proof of stake network is a digital security. It's, a, it's been explicitly stated by the regulators, if, it, if it, there's a stake and it generates yield, it's an investment contract. An investment contract is a security. It passes the Howey test. If, if you've got a pre-mine, an ICO, if you've got a foundation, if you've got developers controlling it, if you're driving hard forks every three to six months, if you have a software-heavy protocol, if the security from the network comes from software, then you've got software developers that can control that network. If it's a permission network, who gets to stake their coins, right? Do I get to stake 92% of the network for the next 90 seconds? Who gets to stake their coins? If someone controls access to the network, it becomes a security. So the issue there is 
everything that's a security is in a regulatory gray zone. And in order for you to invest in any of those things, you have to be willing to accept the securities risk, the legal risk, the, com uh, the competitive risk, and, uh, and the literal cybersecurity risk. Will it be hacked? Will it be copied? Will it be banned? That's very simple. Will it be hacked? Will it be copied? Will it be banned? Okay, before I buy Bitcoin, I would ask those three questions. And then before I would endorse it, here's a very, it's important ethical question. Is it property or is it security? If you're the mayor of a city, if you're a senator, a governor, if you're a president of a country, if you're a public official, if you're the head of the army, the Navy, the Air Force, if you run any nonprofit organization, you can't endorse a security. You can only endorse a property. It's reasonable for you to say, I believe a, a chicken in every pot, everybody should have a home, a chicken, a farm, and some Bitcoin. You understand? Because I just endorsed four flavors of property. I could even say you should have some gold in the basement because they're deemed as common property. But if I were to say, <clears throat> I think you should buy um, my yo-yo dime stock, and I think that Facebook stock is a better store of value than the US dollar. And if I think that, uh, you know, Sailor Moon coin is, uh, is really good or Sailor Moon two coin, because there's not just one coin, right? There's multiple Sailor Moon coins, you know, or son of Sheba dog coin is whatever. Now, the issue really is, is it property? I, I, it's, it's not that, you know, that people say the maximalists say there's only one thing. Let me give you a more nuanced view. <clears throat> it's not that I think that it's impossible to create another property token. It's possible. For example, if you took a fork of Bitcoin, if the Chinese government forked Bitcoin and they created China coin and they said it's only legal to mine, to mine China coin in China, and you can custody China coin, you can sell and trade China coin, and you can mine China coin. And they started with a fork of Bitcoin. They would have basically applied um, a sovereign, they would have created a sovereign form of property. If the Canadian government said uh, you can mine, uh, you can use the same Bitcoin protocol or something comparable to the Bitcoin protocol. And they said, you can mine can Canada coin in, in Canada then you could imagine, like, if you're a Canadian investor, you might want to own that. Like, just like if you're in Canada, land in Canada is property. You see, I don't want to own it because I, I, I don't want to live in Canada and I don't want to own Chinese land. But land in China and land in Canada are property. Bitcoin is global property. If I'm a global investor, I want to own the global thing because that's the strongest network effect because a guy in Tokyo or London or Paris might want to buy my Bitcoin for me. But you can create a crypto property network by making it legal tender or by giving it a tax advantage or by say, just simply saying it's illegal to mine anything other than Canada coin in Canada and Canadian banks can handle Canada coin and Canadian banks cannot handle anything else, or, or maybe they can handle Bitcoin and Canada coin. You've got two forms of property. Just look, silver and gold are property. Soybeans and, and, you know, and dirt, sawdust are property, I guess, right? There, there could be multiple forms of property, but here's where you go awry. If I start a company and I, and I issue half the tokens to my friends and family, and I control the protocol, and then I sell 10% of the tokens to the public. And if I have the ability to change the monetary policy, I, I have to disclose to the public who it is that controls the policies. What, what if I were to sell you, you know, like if I sold a million shares of MicroStrategy, and then like, and then like two years later, you found out that I actually had 100 million more shares, I didn't tell you about, right? So, something like that, right? It's, it's a problem. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, thing that's, the thing that's powerful about Bitcoin, which makes it a solution to a 250 to $500 trillion problem, is 
we have perfected a crypto property, at least one in cyberspace. And the monetary policy of Bitcoin is pretty much set in stone on pizza day. If you roll the clock back to May 22nd, 2010, you know, it was like, we're going to issue this much Bitcoin between now and 2140, and they're going to run off of transaction fees for the next thousand years. And if you were to say to me, Mike, what's the, what is the monetary policy and how's the network going to work for the next thousand years? I can credibly describe it. And if you said, do you think it's going to change? No. Like it, it's not that there isn't some risk. Like an asteroid can hit the earth and your ranch land in Kansas will be worthless property. Right. I mean, heck, I mean, I can sell you land in Florida and it can sink in a swamp. So there's a tsunami that can wipe out your beachfront. So there is risk in property, just like there is risk in Bitcoin. But with good faith, I can say to you, I think I know the monetary policy. I don't think anybody can change it. I can't change it. I have no intention to change it. And so that's what makes it useful for $500 trillion worth of companies, insurance companies, governments, banks, to use this as what? As a, as a foundation for a balance sheet. It's like, uh, I want to build New York. I'm going to want to build New York on uh, granite or schist. New York's built on schist. It's a very heavy stone. Now, is it easy to move? No. Is it high speed? No. What's it do? It just lays there. Does it need to do anything? No. What's the single most important thing? If you buy Manhattan for like 27 pounds worth of glass beads in 16 something or whatever, and I give you Manhattan, what is it you want Manhattan to be 500 years later? A heavy rock. It's just there. You want it, yeah, you want it to still be there. You want something with durability, integrity, predictability. You want the heavy, if Man Manhattan happens to be, a very heavy rock. Now we did a lot of stuff on top of it, right? We built, you know, the buildings are like platforms. They're like exchanges, right? And then the companies are securities. We built things, we traded things, you know, there's been more than one country that controlled Manhattan. You know, there's been different currencies. There's probably been who knows how many currencies traded in Manhattan. Stuff comes and it goes. But the foundation of Manhattan, which is property, property, what you want it to be is heavy, heavy and durable. So I, when you look at everything else, I would just say, yeah, they're, they're all interesting, but they're competing. If, if, if they're competing as non-compliant tokens, then they're going to work in the gray market. And will they be able to become compliant? And what does it mean to be compliant? Will, will you be able to trade these tokens for the next 10 years? And will you have to make a disclosure? And what's the disclosure? And what will the SEC say? And I don't know, right? It's like that is venture capital and it's speculation. And if you see the world as crypto only, then you live in that world. But you got to keep in mind that Fortnite can issue tokens and, you know, and Activision can issue tokens. So you're competing against Facebook and Microsoft and Google and Apple. And you're like, well, why aren't they in the market right now? Well, because certain things are non-compliant and they're illegal. That's why they're not in the market right now. Right. Be, that's why they're not. And why, what you have is you have a, an industry crossing the chasm. The first decade was offshore entrepreneurial wild west and then the next decade is onshore institutional and we're in the middle and we're going to be in the middle for three to five years <clears throat> and, and what do you have you have like tether like it's an offshore entrepreneurial successful company does the world need it yeah the world needs it if you're in turkey or argentina and you need dollars and your choice is lose your dollars in the bank or whatever you need it right Will Apple or Microsoft use it? No. <laughs> right? So will they become public and get registered in the U.S.? <laughs> you know, will, will it be small companies in the U.S. that grow to be big companies like Silvergate Bank? Will it be offshore entrepreneurs that come onshore? 
or will it be JP Morgan, Bank of America, will they, or Goldman Sachs, will they back into this business? And the truth is nobody knows, right? My, my best bet would be if I had to forecast, I would say that there'll always be some gray market offshore. There's something, but um, I, don't, I don't think the massive growth is there. The hundred trillion dollar opportunity is is to provide the foundation for the mega for the 500 trillion dollars worth of capital in western europe and the united states if you can be half of that or a third of that right that's a mega opportunity right you want to be a vendor for google apple amazon facebook jp morgan citigroup the united you want the united states government to buy 100 billion dollars worth of bitcoin right i mean you get really big when you have governments institutions, mega corps as your customers, right? The, the DuPonts, they came over a small time, but how do they get big? They got big by selling gunpowder to the United States, right? And they had presidents as customers buying their product. So ultimately, whoever manages to sell crypto property, cryptocurrency, and, you know, and crypto exchange to the mega, uh, the mega nation states, they'll succeed. Like Coinbase, for example, is much more compliant, right? They're in the U.S. They're publicly traded, right? They're on one side of the trade. You know, you've got players like FTX and Binance on the other side of the trade. They're rich. They have richer product offerings. They're more articulate. They're higher speed, higher velocity. And you know, just like you can you can bet on the outcome of a football game offshore, but you can't bet on the outcome of a football game onshore. <laughs> what will happen? So um, I, I would say they're just totally different things. And uh, no digital security is ever going to displace Bitcoin, as, which is a digital property. The only thing that can displace digital property is a better digital property, which means it needs to be engineered and it needs to have the same uh, legal, ethical, political characteristics. Okay. Right. Digital securities are going to compete with each other. And and the rules of the game are going to change every six months to every 12 months. Right. I mean, you can see them right now. Like, for example, uh, the regulators make you delist 100 tokens on a DeFi exchange. Well, how can you delist anything on a DeFi exchange if it's really DeFi? If it was DeFi, you couldn't delist anything. So it's kind of not DeFi. It's an exchange somewhat compliant with some people in control of it. And uh, what will be allowed to prosper? And the answer is, who knows? The states are involved. You know, the opinion of the states is different than the opinion of the federal regulators. Different regulators have different opinion. Different nation states have different opinions. And even if, even if I marched in front of you, like if they put me in charge of the most important regular in the world today. And I had a perfect 97 page plan to provide a, a path to regulatory compliance for security tokens, for di cryptocurrencies, for stable coins, for property, for exchange. If I had the perfect plan, there's no guarantee you could get it through Congress. There's no guarantee <laughs> you get it through the Senate. There's no guarantee that the, that the other agencies would agree with it. There's no guarantee that other agencies, the Western world would agree with it. So we don't really know the reason, it, it's not that I don't think there's opportunity, but the reason that I'm focused laser-like with laser eyes on Bitcoin is, A, Bitcoin is property, not a security. B, the use case of Bitcoin is to sort, serve as property, which is a low velocity use case right now, which is the least controversial one. If, a, if, you know, if an investor, if Ray Dalio bought $10 billion of Bitcoin to hold forever, tomorrow it doesn't represent any regulatory question there's no existential question is it legal to do that yeah what's the tax treatment capital gains kobe it right? sounds like uh sailor might be bullish on crypto punks <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe but i i mean i agree i took I, I agree with the thesis right like my personal opinion is you buy bitcoin because there is, it cannot change it does not change and it is well understood and in 50 years from now you will know Bitcoin will be the same as Bitcoin currently is. Uh, and if the economy is a relative, like a, a reasonably solved game, then Bitcoin will be worth multiple millions in 50 years. You buy Ethereum 
or whatever else in the Ethereum world that is currently in a knife fight with each other because it does change and the problems that they're solving are important problems. I think a decentralized financial layer for the world is a very important problem, but everything Sailor just described is true, right? Like it's unclear how the um, the regulators will treat them. Like obviously the regulators have spoken several times about stable coins, DeFi, governance tokens, and the majority of shit is clearly a security. It's clearly just reg arb um, from people in around the world. So I 100% agree with that uh, with that thesis. And I think uh, from your position, it's like very, very, very clear that that is the optimal solution. The distinction that I make, I think it's helpful is <clears throat> you've got a portfolio. Let's say you have $100. What portion of it is a saving, a savings account that you want to save for 100 years? <laughs> 10 years at least, a long time. That portion you want to save in strong property. In a, an inflationary environment, if you're going to save money for 30 years, you either got to buy land or some strong property, or and Bitcoin, I think, is the strongest property. Um, and you decide what. I mean, I, I respect any decision. You want to buy art, you want to buy land, you want to buy trophy assets, you want to buy something that'll hold its value for 30 or 40 years. You do that, you're a saver. <laughs> It becomes pretty obvious if you live in uh, if you live in Argentina and I told you the currency is going to lose 75% of its value in the next 12 months. If you're switching uh, from the peso to the dollar, you're just a saver, right? You're, you're not an investor. Yeah, it looks like an investor or speculator, but you're not. You're just a, you're just converting from weak to strong asset. There's another part of your portfolio. You're an investor. Okay, you're taking risk. Like is is Apple. Is Apple better than Peloton? Is it better than GameStop? Is it better than ETH? Is it better than Solana? Is it better than Uber? Is, it, is a private company better than a public company? Right? Is a crypto uh, project better than uh, an equity finance tech project? Do you want to buy a biotech gene splicing thing? They're all just different ventures. You're taking a venture and you got an investment. Just, you know, I think my view there is just you deserve to understand what you're investing in. <laughs> If you're investing in a public company, you've got, you can read my 10K and you can see who owns it. If you're investing in a private company, maybe you can. If you're investing in a crypto project and you don't know who controls it and how many there are, right? You're at a disadvantage, right? So the friction comes from, are there fair disclosures as to the risk you're taking? And then the third category is uh, speculation. So when you're when you're betting on Puppy Coin Three, you know the <laughs> sequel, or or like Sailor Moon Coin. I I can't believe there's a Sailor Moon Coin, but I really can't believe there were two. It's Apparently, like, Sailor Moon Coin's up three hundred percent during this episode because you said it twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I don't doubt you, but uh, so and by the way, I it's like to just just for the record to be straight, I. I don't begrudge people the ability to speculate on whatever coin. And I, I obviously don't have a problem with you investing in whatever you want to invest in. <laughs> I personally am a public figure and I would, I only choose to articulate and advocate and educate on Bitcoin because I believe it is the, it is the, uh, what I'll call ethical safe haven for a public figure. If it was a secure, like you won't, I don't even endorse my own stock. You see, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not going to endorse Apple. I'm not going to endorse Google. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give investment advice. I mean, the definition of investment advice is if you're investing in a security, if you're investing in property, I'm giving you lifestyle advice. <laughs> my lifestyle advice is trade your weak currencies for strong currencies, get a place to live. <laughs> You know, if you have if you have excess funds, you know, it's good to have a home that you can live in the rest of your life. That's lifestyle advice. Control your destiny. Right. And um, and lifestyle, you know, I would say macroeconomic political advice is all things considered. If you can own a piece of property that doesn't get taxed two percent a year, like like don't if you buy land in Florida or a house in Florida, you do get pet charged two percent a year. 
That means over 100 years, you're going to pay 200%. You're going to pay more. You're going to pay 500% over 100 years because they're going to appraise the value of the property up and charge you 2% of the appraised value. So I just give common sense advice, which is if you know you're going to have the property stripped out of your hands in 10 years because of inflation and taxation, that's not a good saving strategy. Find something you can hold for 30 years and maybe give to your children. And if you don't have children, you want to give it to something you can hold to live on. And if you don't, and if you don't need that, something you can give to your favorite charity, right? Make the world a better place. And I just leave it at that. And I, one thing I learned on Twitter is stay in your lane. Like, the, you know, the way to get ripped to shreds <laughs> is you, you know, you start to express a, a, an opinion nuanced or otherwise about someone else's field of expertise. And, and what you find is like, you know, all of a sudden you're debating the dude who's got the Nobel Prize or the, the PhD <laughs> that studied it for 27 years. And he's going to make an example out of you in front of his 437,000 followers. And then all the trolls are going to gleefully <laughs> feast on your you know, cyber flesh. So, I, you know, like I, I, I just, I stay out of that just because I'm not here to give you trading advice. I can't time the market. I don't understand all those risks. I, I know there's a risk an asteroid will hit the earth. And I know there's, you know, there's a black swan risk and maybe, you know, demons come down from <laughs> hell above or heaven below or whatever. And they screw with Bitcoin. I get it. But all things considered, you're going to lose 90% of, you know, your money over the next 24 months if you're in a hyperinflating environment by doing nothing. So my view is if you're guaranteed to lose 90% of your assets to do nothing, then, I, you know, you might as well do something. And, and it's like I said to people on Bitcoin, it's like, you don't like Bitcoin? You think it's 95% likely to fail? Okay, then only allocate 5% of your money to it. <laughs> right? yeah, if, you think, if you think it's 99% likely to fail, then you might as well put 1% of your money in it, right? Like, so I, I think that people oftentimes, they don't get their risk right. There is a risk to doing nothing. And the risk of doing nothing in a monetary sense is the monetary inflation rate. So when the monetary inflation rate hits 25%, it means that there needs to be a 25% chance of Bitcoin going to zero in the next 12 months for you not to want to buy it. And when the monetary inflation rate hits, you know, in, in Lebanon or Turkey or Argentina or someplace, when it hits 50 or 75 or 80 or 150%, the risk of doing nothing is far higher than the risk of doing something. So I like the Manhattan analogy, uh, because of the, the scarcity, uh, scarcity that exists there of a very heavy <clears throat> rock. But one of the components that's important there is that Manhattan is ideally situated on the East Coast. And because of the activity that uh, occurs there, the gathering of economic productivity that lives on top of very heavy rock is what makes it the most valuable. And one of the critiques you see about Bitcoin is that there's not a ton of activity. There's some like layer two or some attempts to do smart contracting using Bitcoin as security or companies that are using Bitcoin uh, as a security layer for other economic activity. Is there a risk though of there not being enough of that so that there's just not enough activity on the very heavy, very valuable rock in isolation? Or is it okay <clears throat> that it's just a very heavy rock that doesn't do very much? I, I don't think there's any risk. And I, I think that a lot of people misperceive the network effect that's already there. But let's, let's parse that a little bit. So first of all, I know Manhattan well. I've sailed around it. Uh, it's sitting between the East River and the Hudson River. And I've gone up the Hudson River. The Hudson River is nature's great highway. It's a mile wide. It's pretty much straight the entire way, except for the bend at West Point, which is why they built that fortress at West Point. And, uh, and you can't help but conclude this is the perfect place to build a seaport if you're going <clears> to <throat> create a country. <clears throat> so Manhattan is the greatest city in America because of its geographic setting, because of the rivers, the ports, your ability to harness water power, air power, sea power, and also because of that schist and the, the rock. 
having said all that, there are many great cities in the world. There's London, there's Paris, there's Tokyo, right? There's Hong Kong, there's Singapore. They've all got a story, okay? And so ultimately, if you're, if you're going to own Manhattan property, you're competing against all those other cities as well. And Manhattan is a 20th century um, real world uh, net network, right? All the great cities of the world, they're all the nexus of an empire. Venice was a nexus of an empire. Rome was a nexus of an empire. And when the empire flourished, the city flourished and they built great buildings and you can see them manifest themselves in the architecture. And then when the empire failed, right, uh, the city calcified and fossilized, you know, and started to sink one way or the other. So <clears throat> let's look at Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin's the greatest city in cyberspace. The difference here is, you know, you don't need 25 great cities in cyberspace. You definitely need one. But if you're a wealthy business, if you're an asset holder in Beijing or Tokyo or Moscow or London or Paris or Rio or New York or California or LA, all of them can park their money in Bitcoin. And so in that regard, uh, being the greatest piece of real estate in cyberspace is an advantage. The other advantage is uh, there's only 21 million city blocks. Whereas <clears throat> if you look at New York City, they can develop that and they expand it out to the boroughs, to Queens and to Brooklyn and there's zoning and you could build up and there's no, you know, there is some scarcity to the acreage, but there isn't necessarily the same scarcity to the square footage and it's uncertain and it's very political. And because it's very political, it meant that it was dilutive and you could be dilutive or you could be impaired, right? You could own an apartment building in New York City and a politician could pass a law or rent controlling it. And now all of a sudden your rent is capped by one third of what it should be, right? And that's not a hypothetical, right? That's a real. And so <clears throat> Bitcoin is advantageous because the 21 million blocks are probably capped there for 10,000 years. And if you own a block of Bitcoin, you could rent it out to any, any bank or a counterparty anywhere in the world at the prevailing market rate. And uh, the mayor of San Francisco or New York can't rent control your block of Bitcoin. So that's another big advantage. In terms of speed, you got to keep in mind, you know, like 10,000 companies could buy $10 billion of Bitcoin each and just hold it on their balance sheet. And then, you know, this, the network would be worth $100 trillion and it wouldn't have to move more than once every year, once every decade, right? The underlying asset doesn't have to move. There are applications of Bitcoin. Uh, do you look at how, fat, how many times my stock has been traded in the past 18 months? <clears throat> Do you know how my stock was traded today? Today, there are microstrategy calls, puts, the spot market, the converts, and the junk bond. They're all trading all the time. They're Bitcoin derivatives, right? Just like Beto is a Bitcoin derivative, right? Just like, you know, Block is a Bitcoin derivative. But, uh, you know, just like uh, there are a lot of Bitcoin, every Bitcoin miner is a Bitcoin derivative. There are 24 publicly traded Bitcoin miners by the end of this quarter. Every single time one share trades hands, Bitcoin moved. So you could say it's low velocity. What I would say is Bitcoin could be a $100 trillion network without a layer two, be, w without lightning, without any higher speed transaction network. It could be a $100 trillion just based upon... Uh, the use case as a treasury asset. Let me ask the question, like how fast do blocks of granite underneath Manhattan move? Like how often do you have to move a city block underneath a building in New York City in order for New York or the, the land of value? The point really is the foundation doesn't have to move. The foundation just has to exist right? Uh, for to create value. So I, I think that the, the transaction argument is wrong on a number of bases because people don't, they, they don't understand the use case, which is, I just want to hold $5 billion of Bitcoin for a hundred years. And every single time I pay an employee, that's Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin derivative, right? 
everything that MicroStrategy does is now uh, resting on a foundation of Bitcoin, <clears throat> just like just like that building stands for a hundred years on a block of granite in Manhattan and everything that comes in and out of that building was predicated upon that block of schist not moving, right? It has value. You think it doesn't have value. Let's play the other thought experiment. I'm going to convert, you know, all that schist into quicksand. I'm going to turn the dial or into swampland or into like a bog. And now what happens to your New York, right? It's like it has value. So the second point I'd make is, if you look at the Lightning Network, the Lightning Network is a non-custodial layer two network, you know, based upon pretty advanced cryptography. And there's no reason why you can't do 8 billion transactions an hour on it for next to nothing. So you can move money at the speed of light. You can move the property and you can move the Bitcoin uh, at the speed of light at high frequency for next to nothing on lightning. There's nothing that precludes you from creating lightning competitors too, right? Lightning is an obvious network. I think it's going to be, it, it seems to be the winning layer too, but, <clears throat> and it's an, it's an open source permissionless layer two transaction network. You can also create a, um, uh, a permissioned, uh, a permission compliant called a layer three network. Like let's take cash app. By the way, FTX is one. I mean, FTX and Binance and cash app, uh, you know, they're all, you know, layer three custodial application networks. You know, how fast does Bitcoin move on Binance? Seems like it moves pretty freaking fast to me. Like, and there's, how many tens of millions of people with Cash App? Now they've got Lightning integrated, and you could. And before Lightning, you could send Bitcoin cash tag to cash tag for next to free, right? Instantly. So um, it's pretty obvious that to me, as an engineer, the solution to this problem is you want to layer one optimize for durability and integrity. Right. You want it to be true, true and durable over, you know, and, and, and secure, true, durable and secure. How long? For 10,000 years. Like, for example, say you're going to build a building in Manhattan. And I said, OK, I'll give you the I'll give you a lease on the building, but it's only good for 10 years. Well, would you build any building with a 10 year ground lease? No. What if I gave you a 12 month ground lease? Can you build anything? No. Let's take Bitcoin mining. <clears throat> Bitcoin mining's got a clear path to 2140 for block rewards, and you've got transaction fees that are market driven. Uh, it's a business that you can finance. You can invest and expect to be in the business 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Let's take ETH. Well, you know, if ETH flips the proof of stake, the entire ETH mining network is murdered next year. You think you can finance that? You think anybody will give you a loan for that? You, you, you can't take the company public. If you're a CEO and you went, you tried to take that company public, institutional investors would laugh at you. Are you kidding? Right. But you're somewhere borderline between, you know, am I committing fraud? Am I a fool? Am I destroying capital? Like it, you can't build a business on top of a foundation that is not fixed. And when I'm talking about fixed, didn't how many times did the difficulty bomb move? Didn't it move from 2015 to 2016 to 2017 to 2018 to 2019 to 2020 to 2021? Like the difficulty bomb thing keeps getting pushed back. Like the monetary policy is changing every 12 months. How long do you need to have it? You need to have a monetary policy fixed for a hundred years uh, uh, if you want to be property. Okay, how long will it be before I will trust you? Like, for example, <clears throat> I go buy, an, I buy a ground lease in London, and the lease is good for 300 years. <laughs> and then I read in the newspaper that some judge found the lease to be non-constitutional, and he revoked it. And the, the tenant lost their building and lost a billion dollars because the ground lease is only good for 27 months. And now, and then someone calls me and says, oh, well, we fixed that, not to worry. You know, that judge retired, and we don't think anybody else feels the same way. How long as an investor do you have to wait before you would feel comfortable going back and investing on that property? 
Like I, I think that um, <clears throat> 10 years is a short period of time. Like Bitcoin has been sitting with the same exact protocol for 10 years. And after 10 years of beating on it, then, you know, then you went through the fork wars. If the, if, if the original protocol had not won the fork wars, if, it, if they had not run the block size wars, it probably would have restarted the clock another five years, mm -hmm. right? That the fact that the big blockers lost and the small blockers won meant that you could say, well, it looks like uh, the protocol is pretty anti-fragile and nobody can change it. And that's why I would bet a billion dollars on it or 10 billion, right? Or my life or my career right? or my reputation. Like, like what, what happens if you invest in that thing and it goes to zero, right? Like companies bankrupt, right? Think, think about what that means to a public official. To a public official, it's like maybe you go to jail, yeah. okay? And so if you look at these things, I would say before you put your weight on something, before you trust your life to it and all your assets to it, you need to be pretty sure. And, a, and a, if you said to me, here's a protocol, it's indestructible, it's property, nobody can control it, nobody can change it. I would say, well, how long has it been unchanged? You say 36 months. I'm like, eh, I think I'll wait another few years. Okay, 10 years. Well, like, now we fought over it, hundreds of billions of dollars were at stake, 10 years. Where are we at now? Oh, now we're risky. Now we're at the point where uh, a company, where a controlling shareholder who's the founder of the company with more than 50% of the voting stock, after going through contortions, can maybe, right? Do you know what it cost me to buy Bitcoin? To pay $250 million in a Dutch auction to be able to buy $250 million of Bitcoin. That's what it cost you after 12 years of an unchanging monetary policy that survived the block size wars. Okay. And uh, that was risky. Now it's less risky. So uh, if you look at all the other things, the pro every hard fork starts the clock again. I, I don't even want you to be able to do a hard fork. <laughs> like, it's like, the point is, if you're, if you're trying to build on Manhattan, someone said, well, we're going to shift it slightly. You, you know what's, what we call slight shifts in the foundation of a city? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. <laughs> we call them earthquakes. One point for ledger. <laughs> <laughs> a profound difference uh, between um, building a company and building on a property. If you're building on a property, what you want to hear is there hasn't been an earthquake in a hundred years, and it's going to be the same in a hundred years. And then all of the bells and whistles, we build on the layer two and the layer three, right? All, the innovation is going to be in Square Cash App. It's going to be at Binance. It's, there's plenty of innovation. You want innovation? Look at FTX. Very innovative. I mean, there's a lot of innovation. The do you look at any of the bitcoin DeFi stuff like uh i forgot what it's called is it called stack stacks stacks i don't remember i don't remember either. <laughs> yeah, that, i mean that the key question here is is we we use decentralization we, we used uh we used a decentralized crypto network to create a global non-sovereign property you can also use it to create sovereign property i just gave you the example china coin Canada coin. Can you use it to create other things? Can you use it to create cryptocurrency? I don't know. We'll see. Right now, cryptocurrencies are digital currencies and they're run by organizations and there's regulatory compliance issues. What are the compliance issues around applications? Right? I mean, there's a lot of great applications. It just it, The issue becomes one of what, what are companies good at? Companies are good at compliance. They're good at hiring an army of lawyers in order to figure out you know, circumstances under which it is legal to offer life insurance in Massachusetts, right? That's, it's a complicated issue. Will that be solved with a DeFi? Maybe there'll be a gray market thing, but it, it's going to sit in this non-compliant gray market zone. And, uh, and the rest of the use cases, they all are going to be competitive. They're going to compete against centralized companies. 
right? If you read the Crenshaw memo, and the Crenshaw, have you read it? Do you know what I'm referring to? I do not. It's a memo written by a commissioner of the SEC, one of five, Caroline Crenshaw. If you read the memo, it's specifically on DeFi. And it, it's pretty clear what, what she's saying, which is we know DeFi is well-intentioned and we can understand the appeal of, of having a high speed, high velocity way uh, to do finance. We also understand that there are organizations and development teams that have to configure these things and they have a lot of power over it. And even though you're well-intentioned, it doesn't absolve you of the obligation not to abuse the investor, the retail investor. And you may inadvertently be doing it, even though you don't know you're doing it. And as far as we're concerned, these things are mostly decentralized and name only, and we're going to treat them the same as we treat centralized crypto exchanges. And maybe you ought to come see us. And if you read this one sentence, they say, come see us. Our phone has not been ringing and we have never failed to answer the phone, call us. And so the takeaway from that, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. You should read it. But uh, the takeaway from that is, look, uh, there is an idealistic future, but there's also, uh, there's also the scourge of boiler room, penny stock, pump and dump schemes. And just because you're an idealist pursuing the future, it doesn't absolve you of responsibilities uh, to fair disclosure and fairness and not to abuse retail investors. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ethical, long before the SEC Act of 33, there are some simple ethical rules like do not lie, cheat, and steal. Okay? So forget about SEC laws. Thousands, 10,000 years ago, there was rules like do not lie, cheat, and steal. And then if you read the securities laws, they kind of convert do not lie, cheat, and steal into a bunch of expectations. And along with that has come some good, has come some bad. The bad is, and I'll freely admit, it's like it's too expensive to come public. It costs you $10 million a year of overhead. There's no way to quickly issue a public token. <clears throat> you know, the, the government says, you know, they say you got to be a bank to issue a stable coin, but they won't let you be a bank. They say we want a bank to issue stable coin, but now, but Facebook found a bank, Silvergate, and then they had to drop DM. Why? I mean, so, so on one hand, the politicians don't want you to do these things. On the other hand, they say there's a way to do it, but they don't make it easy to do. That's, you know, the crypto community has got that issue. But the other side of the coin is, you know, if you give somebody $50 billion of chips and you take it and you use it to speculate on Dogecoin and you lose all the money, right, then there's a run on the bank and people lose $50 billion of U.S. dollars, but they thought it was stable, but it wasn't stable, right? There's a problem with that, right? And, and there's a concern. And um, so I, I think that that's going to have to get sorted out and it's a long, long road. It's not a, yeah, I do. It's not a I do think word. the I do think the the like you know honest path is difficult, and because um, you know you have a, an environment today where uh, I think you have the most the highest amount of retail investors ever, right? Robin Hood over the last couple of years became exceptionally popular, um, and retail are like trading options now because I think monetary policy over the last um, like. 10, 15, 20, however many years, has driven inequality to a point where regular people feel that they cannot um, they cannot save for the future or their financial goals are uh, uh, escaping from them. Um, so I think that environment plus the privatization of profits um, with accredited investor laws and the securities laws and it being very expensive for people to go public and it'd be very difficult for retail investors to uh, to put risk on a, a reasonable valuation. And throughout this year, all these IPOs have just gone down only, like Robinhood is down 84%. Um, there's, there's been tons of these cases. So I understand from a retail investor's point of view, 
they want to put risk on somewhere and they have no opportunities. So it just ends up being somewhat like gambling. And all they want to do is buy a house and they see the house prices running away from them faster than their wages are going up or faster than they can save. Um, so, so I do think it is a, a long road. And um, I think crypt, a lot of crypto exists in this regulatory arb, which has been abused by bad actors and people who are most tolerant to taking those personal risks by running something fraudulent or running a scam. Um, but at, on, on the other hand, I also see a world where uh, it's allowing people access to uh, investment opportunities that they that normally would be restricted just for venture capitalists and uh, and stuff. So I do think it's an interesting moment in history and um, a lot of sort of social and economic issues are uh, converging. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize we're about 30 minutes over the amount of time we, <laughs> we said. And I, I do want to say I have massive respect for you because I have huge respect for anyone that has a lot of conviction in uh, in a belief and then executes on that conviction but not just a little bit you like you've gone all in um and um i've got a lot of respect for for that um on every episode we uh kobe, we asked kobe before oh, yeah. we do that real quick i have one yeah, sorry. quick super quick yes no type in. do you hold a significant amount of bitcoin personally in addition to through microstrategy yeah, I do. I have 17,732. Awesome. I didn't know that. I had not seen that publicly. So there we go. Yeah, I, t I tweeted that. I mean, okay. I, I bought that. It's like like $9,600 a coin or something. I've had awesome. it for quite I just, a while. I wasn't sure about that. All right, Kobe, continue to alpha. I like that you knew the exact number, though. I don't know the exact number <laughs> of cards I have anymore. Um, but yeah, on every episode, we uh, we ask a guest at the, the very end for some uh, advice, like as like some sort of mantra or piece of wisdom that throughout your life you find yourself often referring to and applying in day-to-day -day life so that our viewers can um, take it away, maybe apply it to theirs, be happier, healthier, smarter, more fulfilled, definitely not financial advice and definitely not to buy Sailor Moon coin. Um, is there something that you can pass on, some wisdom that's been given to you maybe by a teacher or a parent or something that you uh, want to pass on to, to our audience of people that can't read? Focus. <laughs> Fo focus would be the one word, but the, the the piece of advice would be just because you can acquire a thing doesn't mean you can maintain the thing. And it, just because you can maintain the thing doesn't mean you can enjoy the thing. If you take the, uh, a simple example of boat, a lot of people buy a boat and then they realize they got to spend 10% of the purchasing price every year to maintain the boat. And they're like, oh, this is expensive. But even if you can afford to buy the thing and pay 10% of the purchase price every year to maintain it, then they wake up and they're like, I don't have no time to go hang out on this boat. It's like sitting in a marina halfway across the country and they never get to it. So it's like, be careful that your things don't owe you. I, most businesses fail or most business plans fail because the business enters into a new business. They acquire a new business that they can't compete in. And, and it's easy to buy a business or build a product. It's much harder to compete, to be competitive, but it's really hard. The hardest hurdle is to compete profitably forever. Right. So you see, it's like, can you be the best in the world at something against other people that want to be the best in the world at something? And can you make money doing it, doing it? And can you stay competitive and get bigger and better as the market gets better? And so you can imagine out of a thousand things, a thousand good ideas, there's maybe a hundred, a thousand you can do, a hundred you can be good at, and maybe one of them you can enjoy or you can prosper in. And I think that that principle, it holds your personal life. People overextend, they try to do too many things and they acquire stuff and they can't maintain it and they're not gonna enjoy it. So everything becomes dilutive, it's a dilutive distraction. And then in business, so I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs, or how many businesses, every one of the businesses I competed against, they all fail because they overexpanded and they kept doing acquisition after acquisition. It's like, and, and if I look back at all my mistakes, it's like, I don't regret any bad idea I pursued because newsflash, I never pursued a bad idea. You will never pursue a bad idea. Nobody will ever fail because they pursued a bad idea. You will fail 
because you pursued a good idea. You're like, oh, this is a really good idea. I can do this too. And so I went to do that and I found that, oh, it gets exponentially more expensive to compete in that second area. And not only do you have to be better than everybody in the world, but every day someone else gets up with infinite money and infinite power to do it better than you do it. So the conclusion really is figure out, you know, in your personal life, what you need to be happy and focus on it and uh, figure out what you're going to do in your professional life <clears throat> and focus on it. And if you're going to do that thing, be the best in the world of that thing. And when someone comes to you and says, Hey, you know, do you want to launch your own trade show and your own pizza company? And you, do you want to, you know, do this and do that? And would you also like to start your own, whatever hedge fund? Yeah, you can, <laughs> they're giving you the opportunity you're, you're going to find that you'll launch the business and then your core thing that you were good at, you're now mediocre at. And there'll be some younger, hungrier person that's going to say, oh yeah, Kobe's lost the eye of the tiger. He, he's distracted now. You know, he's flirting with all these other things. So I'm going to take his spot, right? I'm going to displace him. And uh, the same holds with portfolios too. It's like, say, if you wouldn't hold it for a decade, don't hold it for 10 minutes. If you're gonna if you're gonna own something, figure out what you own and have the conviction. And if you're gonna invest in something, you know, make sure you do the research to figure out the risk related to investing in it. And if you're gonna trade, you should know that you're the best trader in the world. If you trade soybeans, the guy that trades soybeans that is the best trader in the world with all the information flows and all the proprietary algorithms and all the deal flow advantages and the proprietary whatever, that person knows they're the best in the world. If you're not that person, you're the sucker. And so just generally in life, don't be gallivanting around chasing all these good ideas, walking into markets where someone else owns the market. And don't take on obligations that you can't maintain and you can't enjoy because uh, it's, it, it's a path to dilutive distraction and everybody always overestimates what they can accomplish. It's like, Napoleon dropped an army in, in Russia. Hitler dropped an army in Russia. Julius Caesar dropped an army in Egypt. You know, Napoleon dropped an army in Egypt. You know, everybody drops an army and, you know, the Germans dropped an army in Egypt. You know, it's like everybody thinks they can do more than they can do. And maybe you just ought to figure out what you could be satisfied with and, and have a more modest uh, a modest plan and focus upon making that work for you, your family, your business, your employees, your shareholders. Michael Saylor, thank you so much. Follow Saylor on Twitter. We appreciate you, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you, boss. Everybody can go to uponly.tv to check this episode. It'll be on YouTube as well. Audio platforms, all those places you know and love. Just look for Up Only. Go to uponly.tv slash FTX, our partners for this episode and all episodes where you can trade with zero fees directly from one asset to the other. We thank you so much for supporting us, FTX, track your portfolio, all those good things, stack stats, get recurring, uh, buys in, all the good stuff at FTX, uponly.tv slash FTX. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.